evening. I know you're out there. Good evening. There you go. Thank you. When I was asked to do this, it's another first for me. There's been a lot of those that's happened to me recently. And I've enjoyed every one of them. This evening song service, um, what I liked about it or being asked to do that is I got to pick out what I wanted you to see. So, but I'd like to start off this evening with the reading from the Doctrine and Covenants. Wherefore are the Lord, knowing the calamity which had come upon the inhabitants of the earth, called upon my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., and spake unto him from heaven, and gave him commandments, and also gave commandments to others, that they should proclaim these things unto the world, and all this that it might be fulfilled, which was written by the prophets. The weak things of the world shall come forth and break down the mighty and strong ones, that man should not counsel his fellow man, either trust in the arm of flesh, but that every man might speak in the name of God the Lord, even the Savior of the world. Shall we turn to hymn number 218? Jesus had made an end of these sayings, he touched with his hand the disciples from whom he had chosen, one by one, even until he had touched them all, and spake unto them as he touched them. Turn to him number 219. You don't have far to travel. Now this one, I have to say just a little bit. My wife does not like this song. I don't know if it's because of the, the type of tune it is, the Russian background or whatever, but when I sing it, you know, I wasn't going to say this, but when I sing a song, I see little Russian guys going, dun, 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 you know, but it's the words in this hymn should touch every one of us. What in the world is the ticking noise? Yeah, Metron, you're going to make 
we, that, that's kind of funny that somebody mentioned that because we were talking about the speed of this song and the way it's written, written, the way it's written is a little slow. I don't like it, take it that slow. So we'll go by what, whatever Lou's got planned for us. people where the Lord gave us the restored gospel gave it to Joseph Smith who spread it throughout the land and he was taken from us but we were given the church back again and it was taken from us again in many ways but then it was restored with the remnants we are remnants of a restored gospel. We have to stand steadfast. We have to work diligently to spread the word. So let's turn on our hymnals to number 374. And I would ask you to stand as we sing this with a steadfast faith. to see you here this evening and be able to meet in the house of the Lord. 
I'd like to welcome you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and also to extend a greeting to all of those who are joining us via live stream. We're pleased to have you with us this evening as well. This evening, uh, for the service, the men on the rostrum are members of the Standing High Council, and I will introduce them to you, looking from your left to my right, uh, Brother Steve Timms, Brother Ammon Verdutt, Brother Phil Strecker, our speaker of the evening, Brother Dave Van Fleet, who's hiding behind me right now, and Brother Bill Durr, and Brother Bob Ostrander, and my name is Rick Scott. And it's our pleasure to be able to be with you in worship and praise this evening. To start our service this evening, Sister Megan Romer is going to bring us a musical setting, following which I will bring our scripture for the evening. evening's theme is prepare for my coming by accepting the call to become one. And we know that we all strive to achieve that unity with each other and with our, our fellow saints throughout the world. In that vein, I'm going to be reading from the 77th section of the Psalms, 11 through the 14th verses. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. I will meditate also of all thy works and talk of thy doings. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Thou art the God that doth wonders. Thou hast declared thy strength among the people. May we be his people in worship this evening. We will continue by singing hymn number 15, All Creatures of Our God and King. We will stand for the singing of the hymn.
our Father in heaven, we are thankful that we can assemble again in your house this day. We are thankful that we can uh, come together and sing praises unto thee, the living God, the King of kings. And Father, we are, are thankful too that we might come together and hear together the gospel preached. We're thankful, Father, that we might uh, come and give an expression of our faith and our desire to serve thee and to walk in thy path and in thy light. Father, as we have come together, we uh, remember too our youth as they have assembled and uh, are seeking thee and seeking that unity. We pray your spirit would bless them as well. We pray, Father, that that good spirit that is omnipresent and that it will uh, reach down and minister unto us this, this hour, that we might draw near unto thee. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A $1 bill met a $20 bill and said, Hey, where have you been? I haven't seen you around here much. The $20 bill answered, well, I've been hanging out at the casinos, went on a cruise, did the rounds of the ship, back to the U.S. for a while, went to a couple of baseball games, to the mall, that kind of stuff. How about you? The $1 bill replied, you know, same old stuff, church, church, church. A.W. Tozer wrote, in God's sight, my giving is measured, not by how much I give, but by how much I have left after I make my gift. Not by its size is my gift judged, but by how much of me there is in it. No one gives at all until he has given all. No one gives anything acceptable to God until he has first given himself in love and sacrifice. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we uh, come at this time truly thankful. We are blessed that we are able to give. And Father, we ask that uh, no matter how much that we can give, that we do give a part of ourselves or all of ourselves unto service for you, that this offering might represent that gift that represents the same gift that Christ gave for us. May we give a gift that represents our love for you and our willing to help others. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
I have uh, two scriptures this evening. The first one is from uh, section 36, 2H. And the Lord called his people Zion because they were of one heart and one mind and dwelt in righteousness. The other scripture is from Matthew 25, a familiar parable. And then at that day, before the Son of Man comes, the kingdom of heaven shall be likened unto ten virgins who took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five of them were foolish. They, were, they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Lest there be not enough for us and you, go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, ye know me not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. share tonight about the songs I had selected. The, the first piece um, you might have recognized is always a campfire song that we sing at camp, and I wanted to remember our youth. Um, Steve, Tim's kind of alluded to our senior high camp starting this week, and then in a couple of weeks we'll have junior high. Um, and this song that I'll sing for you now is actually out of our hymnal, it's hymn number 630. It's a very simple song, but what it um, makes up, relaxing complication makes up for in beauty. So.
like to thank Megan for the special music this evening. And uh, I'm also very pleased to uh, be associated with uh, the men from the Standing High Council. Uh, there, well, there are seven out of the 12 of us here this evening, and um, the others are all, all over, including Senior High Camp. Um, I'd like to begin tonight. Uh, now, I'm not a, a financial analyst, but I'm, I'm going to give you a stock tip here. Uh, my stock tip is that it's time to buy oil. And I'll explain at the end of the sermon just what I mean. The theme for tonight, as you've already heard, is prepare for my coming by accepting the call to become one. Um, I'm going to use a number of uh, um, quotes from Arthur Oakman this evening and also some uh, experiences from, uh, from my youth. You know, the, the rub in the theme this evening is the part of becoming one. It might not seem that hard, but if you stop and think about it, that's kind of been the order of man's existence since, since the very beginning. I mean, we only had to go one generation to find Cain killing Abel, and it hasn't gotten much better since then. We had Jacob and Esau battling over the birthright. Uh, we had uh, Laman and Nephi, they didn't get along, and they ended up being Lamanites and Nephites. Um, you know, more recently, we've heard of the Catholics and the Protestants having wars. Um, I saw on the internet that it's estimated that there's somewhere between 33,000 and 43,000 denominations of Christianity. That doesn't sound like very much oneness, does it? And there's even a, a number of groups within the Restoration, as we all know. And uh, just, what, last Thursday, I think it was, Britain voted to leave the European Union. So even uh, countries are still dividing. And, you know, the same is true in society, right? In the office, there's office politics. I once heard that uh, the only profession that isn't uh, somewhat based on who you know is sports. Sports is the most uh, um, performance-oriented activity that there is. I'm not sure, but then we have uh, the unions versus management. Uh, in, even when we were in school, there were school bullies. And then we get down to the family and how many families we have seen fractured and even neighbor against neighbor. Um, how often does that happen? And then the next part about it is that we talk about peace a lot, don't we? We hear about, I just heard last week about some organization that was advocating peace. Um, a church across town just passed a resolution that called for the Palestinians and the Israelis to come to peace terms. Uh, I'm not sure how much good that will do. And the, the point, the common thread through all of these cries for peace is that you need to make peace. You notice how it's never me that I need to change in order to have peace. It's always someone else. And so that's where we have to begin. If we're going to talk about coming to unity, we have to begin with a change in our own hearts. I once heard it said that uh, men are not brothers. The only way that they're brothers is if they're a brother of Christ. Then they can be brothers of one another. We are prisoners to our own selves, save Christ saves us from ourselves. When I was 15, that was kind of my first activity in Science League was a trip to Nauvoo. Wasn't very many of us, but it was on that trip that I had an experience with the Holy Spirit for the first time. And that summer, I proceeded to change my priorities in life. I caught fire is one of the terminologies that we hear nowadays and tried to make God the number one priority in my life. And when I did that, an interesting thing happened. The very next thing that happened was I became concerned for the spiritual welfare of those around me, particularly my family. And you know, that is also true in the scriptures. If you recall the story of Enos, 
he spent all day in the woods praying for forgiveness. And finally, when the Lord did grant him forgiveness, he immediately began to be concerned for his brothers of the Nephites. Arthur Oakman says that there are two motivations. One is pride and the other is love. And he says that pride is to put ourselves in God's place and then lord it over others. On the other hand, love is the fruitage of divine revelation. Purity of heart is the cause of Zion. Now, in the revelation that came out in 2013, the priesthood were admonished that there was too much pride and self-interest. This isn't the first time this has happened. If you go to the book of Judges, you'll read that at the death of Joshua, the people that had been reasonably righteous to that point uh, ceased to be. They would not hearken to the judges. And if you go to the last verse of the book of Judges, it says, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That sounds a lot like pride, doesn't it? And that was the very sin that uh, Adam and Eve committed in the garden. You know, if you recall the story, the Lord told them, don't eat of this one tree. And then Satan came along and said, if you do eat of this tree, you'll be as gods. And so it was this idea of putting themselves in God's place that appealed to them. And so they fell because of pride. Now, in the scripture reading, I, talked, I read about the parable of the ten virgins. And we know that there were five wise virgins that took extra oil. And it's interesting, it says they all fell asleep. Well, what does that mean? Well, you know, I, I have a couple of ideas, but I'll share one. Um, you know, how long has it been since Christ uttered that parable? Well, I think it was probably, you know, it was Passion Week, right? So it was probably his 33rd year on earth. And also, uh, they say that Christ was born around 6 BC to 4 BC, based on the things that were going on with uh, um, Herod. So that would mean that uh, it was about 1987 to 89 years ago when he uttered this. And so since then, we have been waiting for his return, and it hasn't happened. Well, you know, we all are capable of at least low-level mathematics, right? And so we are estimating, we're calculating, well, if he hasn't come in 1987 years, there's a good chance he's not coming in the 1988th year, so I'll just go to sleep. And that may be what he meant, I'm not sure. But uh, the way we should look at this is that, wow, he hasn't come in 1987 years, it must be getting pretty close. It's time to wake up. And that's the way we should look at it. There is an explanation for this parable in section 45. And it gives two, uh, two things about the interpretation. One is, those that have the extra oil in their vessels are those that receive the truth. That's the first condition. And the second is that they take the Holy Spirit as their guide. Now, I think both of those are big problems for most of the world. They don't do either one of them. And to me, receiving the truth would be the same as accepting the gospel and responding to it. My mother used to tell me that her grandmother accepted the gospel after one sermon. Well, that was pretty rare. Uh, maybe not so rare back then, but it would be nowadays. Now, Kay and I were in Michigan in early May. In fact, there weren't any leaves on the tree yet, trees yet when we were up there. But uh, we saw a very rare bird, uh, at least for Michigan. It was a western tanager, and according to the internet, our sighting of this bird was only the 33rd time one of these had been sighted in Michigan. So we were pretty excited. Well, a lot of birders that were there at this uh, location were excited. Well, that's about how rare faith is in our world today, isn't it? 
It's pretty rare. Now, we did have an exception here in First Congregation. We had an adult baptism here a couple of weeks ago, and that was very exciting. Arthur Oakman uh, has written that doctrine has become unimportant to most people today, and he goes into a lot of reasons. I'm not going to talk about all those reasons right now, but uh, i just like to point out that in every other field except religion, Doctrine or truth is essential. Um, you know, uh, all the astronauts, when they went to the moon, uh, do you think that science was important for them? You know it was. Or how about that uh, bypass operation? Do you think uh, the doctor knowing what he's doing is important? We know that it is. So why is it then that we think good intentions are sufficient or religion. I think part of it is we're so confused because we hear this here and another thing there, and so people are confused. Kind of like the diet recommendations that one year we hear, well, you should eat this, and, and those diet recommendations change. I think uh, some of the fats, uh, trans fats and so forth, are an example of that. Well, and I think another reason is that the professors of religion devise alternative explanations for the scriptures. When Kay and I were in uh, the senior high church school class, so this is going back a long time, uh, we were studying the Old Testament prophets. We had a series of quarterlies on that topic. And each week there were two members of the class that questioned everything. Uh, if it said that Noah built an ark, uh, there had to be an alternative explanation. And so every week, uh, there were these two people raising questions, and then uh, the rest of us were trying to defend the faith, if you will, and kind of got started at, at an early age doing that. It turns out that one of the students in this class was a member of, the S of SDS, a communist, a student communist organization. He ran for a student council at our high school, and he ended his speech, his campaign speech, with an expletive, which got him elected. And I remember writing an essay in English class about how being, how upset I was about that. And the teacher kind of, you know, well, don't worry about it. And then during the Vietnam War, he went to Canada to avoid the draft. And I just feel like maybe there is one example of what Jesus said, by their fruit, you shall know them. The other condition from section 45 is to be led by the Holy Spirit. In Romans 8, uh, it talks about those who are led by the Holy Spirit. And Paul said that there is nothing wrong with those who do that. And that the spiritual man is the person who is concerned with the things of the spirit instead of the things of the flesh. Alma pointed out that those that are led by the spirit are, and he has a list of qualities, humble, meek, submissive, patient, full of love and all long suffering, and have faith on the Lord. So these are the people that are peacemakers. These are people that can bring peace to our world. One of the uh, ingredients mentioned there was humility. I think that is a, a key ingredient. And it is defined as a modest view of one's importance. Um, I felt like my dad was a humble man. And, uh, you know, there were so many times I would ask him a question and he would say, I don't know. He would never venture a guess to answer my question if he didn't know for sure. Um, not, there's not too many people that will do that. And at the time, I used to sometimes get a little bit frustrated that he wouldn't at least take a stab at something. But now I look back with uh, and appreciate his honesty and humility. I think he was a man that had a lot of uh, common sense and wisdom even though he might have had self-doubts. The Oklahoma reunion uh, finished up on Friday, and I would describe 
the presence of the Spirit as one that I had uh, experienced previously, and that is that it was expressed uh, in love, that uh, I felt a great love for the people there at Reunion. And that's the way it should be. And that's kind of how we can discern whether the Spirit that is present is of the Lord or not. This is the way to unity and not by controversy. I've been very pleased with the high priests. We meet about every month, and we've been able to discuss some pretty controversial topics without generating a lot of uh, dissension and controversy. And uh, we'll see this month if we can continue that. But I've appreciated to this point that we've been able to do that. The Lord told the Nephites, he that hath the spirit of contention is not of me. In 2013, we were told in the Revelation that we should let the Spirit direct in the interpretation of the Word. In the first scripture reading, where we're talking about Enoch Zion, it listed four qualities. They were of one heart, one mind, dwelt in righteousness, and there was no poor among them. And so to be one of one mind means that we have to have unity in doctrine. We can't just avoid doctrine. We've got to have it, but we have to be able to come to agreement on it. To, have, to be of one heart would be what we usually think of, that we have a unity of feeling for one another. Now, the Christian world, as I mentioned before, is split because of varying interpretations. And there's uh, a reason for this. And the reason is that they take a scripture because they don't believe in continuing revelation and they split hairs over what that scripture means. The advantage of believing in continuing revelation is that uh, we have additional scriptural scriptures from which to formulate opinions and we believe that the Holy Spirit can lead us into understanding of how these uh, different verses should be interpreted. You know, there's one denomination, and you know who I'm talking about, uh, that celebrates the Saturday as the Sabbath, and they, they built their religion around that. And that's because they interpret those scriptures that way. Um, now, uh, one of the stumbling blocks, in my opinion, in the world of Christianity is that the Apostle Paul was writing with certain people in mind on some of the letters that he wrote. There were the Judaizers that were trying to maintain the Jewish religion that Christ had um, fulfilled with a higher law. But they wanted to keep the traditions of Judaism. Then there was the other group of the Gnostic heretics, and so he had to address them. And so I think that Paul emphasized certain aspects of the gospel that uh, some in Christianity, Christianity today have latched onto to the exclusion of other things in the scriptures. For example, the books of Hebrews and James are discounted in some evangelical denominations. And so I think having the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the inspired version of the Bible helps us to uh, be able to uh, counterbalance some of the writings that Paul had. In section uh, 85, the saints are told to seek learning by study and by faith. Now, it's very important that we have both aspects because as I mentioned in the senior high class that Kay and I were in as youth, there wasn't faith. So you studied about some miracle from the Old Testament and then immediately began trying to figure out an alternative explanation that would fit what we're used to in our daily lives. Well, we can't get very far if some people believe the scriptures and some don't. So in order to have unity, we have to have a common basis of authority. And those are the three books that we have. 
In the New Testament church in Acts 2, we read, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking bread and in prayers. So if our assumptions match, that is, we believe the scriptures, then we can study the scriptures, we can have discussion, and we can come to a common understanding. In section 42, the elders, priests, and teachers are instructed to teach the principles of the gospel as found in the Bible and the Book of Mormon. Now, I understand that there are some that say, huh, it doesn't say the Doctrine and Covenants, so we're not supposed to use that. However, the thing you have to know is that section 42 was given in 1831, and the Doctrine and Covenants wasn't published until 1835, so there was no Doctrine and Covenants at that time. Later revelations talk about using the Doctrine and Covenants as well. One of the things that we've encountered in more recent days is that some have said that the revelations that were given to Joseph Smith Jr. were for his time and do not apply to our day. But one of the things that we say is that, yes, uh, Scripture revelation is given to answer specific questions, and therefore we need to be aware of the context. However, there is also the timeless or the eternal quality of all revelations from the Lord. And so what he said in days gone by still applies today. And so we have to accept that if we're going to come to unity. Unless the Holy Spirit guides us, though, we will still split over different interpretations. You know, it's like for everything you learn, you generate more questions. And I think that's true even in the gospel. But we have to uh, set some of those on the shelf until the answer becomes more obvious later. And I think so many times the Holy Spirit does guide us and we don't realize it because its guidance is very subtle. We don't realize it at the time. I would say that one example might be our hymn singing. Now, I think uh, that we have a very joyful, uh, up-tempo uh, method of singing hymns in this church. Not all churches are like that. And I think part of that is from the leading of the Holy Spirit. And I think part of that is because we have section 119, verse 6, that says that the Lord doesn't want us to sing with grievous sadness. He wants us to be joyful. And I think that is one example of how the Holy Spirit has uh, impressed the Lord's personality on the church. The Holy Spirit leads us to forgive one another. It's impossible to have the Holy Spirit and harbor ill feelings. In the golden age of the Nephites, we read that there was no contention in the land because of the love of God which did dwell in the hearts of the people. The priesthood of the remnant church have gone to Kirtland twice, I think 2004, and I forget when the second time was. And each time we had a marvelous experience. Many uh, wonderful spiritual experiences were had by many. But I heard uh, someone say that in order to have an endowment level experience, we need to have been involved in the construction of the temple. And therefore, we need to construct our own temple with our own sacrifice and our own labor in order to um, have the maximum experience that they did in 1836. I think the same is true for us as the saints. I think we have to know each other thoroughly in order to have the unity and the uh, depth of experience that is possible through the Lord. Kay and I were part of a very close-knit Zions League when we were in our youth. And we had a series of prayer services, three of them, that were characterized by an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, especially the third one. 
And as I look back at that experience, I see that we were close-knit. We were a very close group of people. And that's where I think we have to be as saints today to have this outpouring of the Spirit that will lead us to unity. I think that our experiences this year, Kay and I going to the Iowa and Oklahoma reunions, was better this time than in years past because as we keep going year after year, we're getting to know the people in each of those locations better. And I wonder if we are strangers, can we be one? You know, compromise is necessary in life. Um, for example, in marriage, there has to be compromise. And the same is true to an extent in religion. In the Book of Mormon, we're told to be easy to be entreated. In other words, we have to be able to get along and not be too opinionated. Now, we are here tonight because we respect that the ordinances are unchangeable. But beyond the ordinances, and this is hard for me to say, we have to be somewhat flexible in order to have unity. And so we have to be setting a new trend, a trend that reverses the trend of the world. That is pulling people together instead of dividing them apart. Now, sometimes we've learned that uh, if we're a squeaky wheel, we can get the grease. But if we're going to have uh, a Zionic unity, none of us really can be the squeaky wheel. We all need to be well-oiled so that we can be part of the vehicle that takes us to the kingdom. We need to avoid, avoid controversy, avoid annoyance and distress unnecessarily. We need to be sensitive that there are people with family that may have serious problems that we must be careful not to speak too roughly about, lest we offend them. Another essential element in unity is trust. We have to trust one another. And if we always think that a certain person has an ulterior motive, we can never achieve the unity we would like to. I think uh, the key to this is communication. And I found that uh, by going and talking to people, people that I think uh, have a different agenda than I do, that most of the time we are much closer than I imagined in my mind. And because I went and talked to them, I was able to find out that we are on the same page. 90% of the time, I think it's just a simple misunderstanding. And so we need to be talking more and speculating about what the other person is thinking less. And in 2014, the church was admonished that this trust was fracturing our unity. And as I mentioned before, I think we need to do more visiting to enhance our unity. James wrote, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the vices of the world. So we need unity so that we will be prepared for the return of Jesus Christ. And so I'd like to talk about his return for a moment. Oakman said, we have failed to see that the second coming is not something that happens primarily to us, but in us. I thought that was very interesting. He says that instead of putting the events of the second coming in order, we need to be putting our hearts in order. Now, he says that for those that are spiritually alive, Christ has already come. He has come through his Holy Spirit. In my patriarchal blessing, I was told that I would have the privilege of walking with my Lord and Savior. Now, I'm not sure what that meant, but I can see based on this that uh, how I see him is less important than being obedient to the understanding that I have received. And as I do that, the likelihood that I will see him in person 
will increase. And now this is more than just a, a matter of the heart. It has to be translated into action. As when Jesus asked Peter to feed the sheep, you know, he was a great disciple, but until he went out and started feeding the sheep, he had not fulfilled his mission. And here's a little conundrum. If you think you have done enough for the Lord, then you haven't. Now, I can't explain it. I think part of it is being humble. But if you recall, when Jesus was talking to his apostles, he said, uh, that they would be rewarded for feeding the hungry. And they said, for, and they said you, you fed me when I was hungry. And so they said, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered? They couldn't think. And so Jesus said, inasmuch as you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. But that's the point is that uh, we never feel like we have done enough. It's like, when saw we thee and hungered? That should be how we feel. We should not feel like I've done enough. We should be focused on what needs to be done rather than on the self. Okay, what does it mean to hold the commission to build the kingdom of God? To me, it means that we are responsible for that to happen. It doesn't mean, well, we do what we can, and that's good enough. I uh, used to collect a few cartoons. Sometimes I'd put them up on my bulletin board when I was working. And one of my favorite was a cartoon of a project timeline. And I had all of these lines going on, and on the far right was project completion. And just to the left of that <clears throat> were the words, at this point, a miracle occurs. And I think so often we're thinking, well, if we just do this part, then a miracle's going to happen and we will have the kingdom of God. And I think to do that is a form of tempting God. This past conference, we were told to be zealous about our outreach through public relations and live streaming. And it's important for us to step forward in sharing the gospel or making it possible that those whose calling is to share the gospel might be able to do so. You know, what is one of the things we can do to improve our, our ability to serve? One of the things is to improve our health. We have been told to follow the word of wisdom. And so we need to do that. We can't say that we've done just a little and then a miracle is going to occur. If, if we don't exercise and, and eat right, and I'm talking to myself. There are two groups from the parable that I read tonight. There are those that do and those that procrastinate. Now, the first group is those that are acquiring extra oil for their lamps. And the second group may have very good intentions but are too disorganized to actually get the job done. And so when the Lord comes, the first group is going to be ready and waiting for him. But the second group is going to be surprised. And that's why the scripture says the Lord comes as a thief in the night. And so that door is going to be closed for them, and it will be too late. And hopefully we're not in that second group. In R149 and 7, we are told that Satan can be bound up through faith and unity of purpose. So you can see how important it is that we achieve this unity and that we have faith. With those two things put together, we can have Satan to where he has no power over us. We are told that the Holy Spirit bears fruit in our lives. And that fruit is defined in Galatians with a number of items, but the ones that I think pertain particularly to unity are love, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, and kindness. James wrote, Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. 
And Peter said that those who have these and some other virtues he lists as well will be fruitful in the knowledge of the Lord. This is the knowledge we must have in order for him to come. At his first coming in Jerusalem, everyone saw him. But after his resurrection, only those with faith were allowed to see him. And that's where we are today. It's, he's not coming to everyone. He's coming to those who have faith and righteousness. So let us unite our hearts in one that we may be his people and he may be our God. Arthur Oakman wrote, when there prevails on earth the same kind of unity between men and nations that prevails between the persons in the Godhead, then the kingdom of Zion will have fully come. Okay, at the beginning I said it was time to buy oil. Well, I think you see why. We need to acquire as much oil as we can in the days that remain so that we will have them for our lamps and be prepared for the return of our Lord. We're told that he that hath eternal life is rich. Therefore, it's time to stock up on oil that we might become rich. Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we bow before you to thank you once again for allowing your Spirit to be with us, that we might draw closer to each other and closer to you. And we as your children have come, O oh Father, expecting to be blessed by that Spirit, and we indeed have been blessed, and pray that it might continue to be with us in the days ahead, that we might glorify your holy name. We thank you once again for being with us and pray that as we go now from this place that your spirit might be with us continually throughout this week and the remainder of our lives that we might constantly glorify you, draw closer to each other and to you. And we pray this in Jesus' most sacred name and give you all praise and honor and glory. Amen. Amen.